I'd like to start with uh, thanks to Rob and Edward for bringing me back to New York. Uh, it's my first time in two years. It's not <laughs> that I don't come back <laughs> from Arizona. Um, Rob was actually one of my very first graduate students at Columbia many, many, many years ago. <laughs> I don't know if he considers <laughs> my time with him a success or a failure, but he, at least he's still in the field. <laughs> and, and uh, a word about librarians. I mean, I, I, um, I came to appreciate librarians and the whole uh, book world uh, very early in my career, and I'm very proud that as president, past president of the Association of Slavic Studies, whatever the, the new name is that I can't remember myself, <laughs> and recent president, that we have finally have a, a prize for librarians at our annual convention now, uh, because I think. Um, Librarians are unsung heroes of, of, of our area studies enterprise in, in so many, many ways. We can't really do our work without that sort of fundamental. Um, and Ed, speaking of librarians, of course, is Mr. Slavic librarian and, and was a teacher for all of us in many ways, um, not only by keeping the New York Public Library collections so magnificently up to date and, and comprehensive, but also by as long as I was in New York, sending me notes of things he found he thought I might be able to use. Uh, so thank you, Ed. Thank you, Rob, for this. It's also good to see old friends, Carol, Kathy, Gulnar, <coughs> from my Columbia days. And I'd just like to maybe start. I, 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 uh, I've been living in Elizabeth Valkenier's apartment for the last week, whom I know you met last week. And she had David Engerman's book lying around. Um, so I read it, which I hadn't done before. I mean, I was actually one of the interviewees for his project. At, at great length, he interviewed me and several times. Um, but I had never read the finished project, so I, I um, wanted to know what, you, what background you had. And uh, now I do. I read it backwards, strangely enough. I started with the last chapter and <laughs> went forward. <laughs> I don't, don't ask me why I did that. I must have had some strange reason. And I kind of feel like I'm a multi-decade veteran of area studies. I definitely am a person who, you know, if you go by the categories that he sets up in there, have been closer to area studies than to my professional discipline, which is history. Um, not that I haven't been chair of the history department here and chair of the history department at Arizona State now. Uh, so I, I don't neglect other fields of history, but I um, have rarely been to the meetings of the American Historical Association in my career. Um, and that's partly because at some point I realized, A, they were meat markets for poor, starving graduate students and assistant professors looking for better jobs. Um, and this, that's our, high, our sort of height of hiring period, and it's really an unpleasant sensation. The other thing is that it's so dominated by Americanists that there were very rarely more than three or four panels that dealt with Europe in general and Eastern Europe more specifically. So I, I didn't find a particularly, and, and you know, for all their talk of global and comparative and blah, 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 they didn't really figure out a way to include us in there. Even when there were people from the Russian East European history field in the leadership of the AHA. So my preferred organizations have been the, um, um, what used to be called the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies, which is now the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and I better know that topic since I, title since I helped create it. Um, and uh, the other, if, if I have another association that I'm uh, very f active in, or was active in while I lived in New York, it's the Association for the Study of Nationalities, which um, has a very strong Columbia connection and continues to have its annual conventions here as well. Um, and, and especially since I got more interested in questions of empire and nationality, something, by the way, that David did not cover too much by his own admission. So I think I might try to spend some time talking about the place of, of the non-Russians in um, area studies these days. <coughs> so, so I am an area studies person, uh, most definitely. And I feel most at home uh, in, among area studies scholars. And by area studies, I understand the kind of multi and interdisciplinary approach to our region. Uh, and just as evidence of that, I mean, from the time I got to Columbia, I started teaching, co-teaching. I, I like to team teach. And I think since part of my mission today is to talk about curricular 
prospects. Um, team teaching is uh, something that I, if, if your university or institution will allow you to do this, um, is the best way of achieving, I think, real transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary um, discoveries. The first course I taught was with Robert McGuire, who you must have read about in the, in the literature chapter, um, a course on culture and politics in the 1920s Soviet Russia. And it was a graduate course, and um, one of the graduates of that is now one of my colleagues, uh, Hilda Hugenboom at Arizona State University. But many people went on to write dissertations um, because I think they got excited by the, the uh, dialogue that Bob McGuire and I had in that course. I went on to teach courses with Kathy Nipomnyshi, uh, both our sort of core uh, Harriman Institute area studies intro. And, they have the, uh, syllabus. and you have the syllabus. But also, uh, we, we pioneered a new um, undergraduate course, which was designed to capture the, the moment, the post-colonial moment, you might say, called Cities and Civilizations, an Introduction to Eurasian Studies, in which we, we explored the city texts of St. Petersburg, Moscow, Kazan, Kiev, New York, and some Brighton other one. Beach. Which one? Brighton, Brighton Beach, Brighton right, Brighton Beach. Beach. Um, and again, I think that's going to be continued at Arizona State University now, too. Back to where I am now in my perspective um, on things. I've, I've left Columbia four years now uh, to take a job as chair of the history department at Arizona State University, where I was the sixth Russian East Europeanist to be hired. Uh, I came from University of Columbia, which for three years did not have a Russian East European historian, which is this something we might talk about. Why is it that Columbia, um, a kind of bastion of Russian and East European history, was able to go for three years without hiring someone to replace me, Ortman, and our East Europeanists who didn't get tenure. The fact that Rob got hired, by the way, as a Soviet <coughs> bibliographer is another story of the state of Russian area, Russian East European area studies at Columbia. It took, I don't know how many years, for them to fi find a a Slavic bibliographer for one of the most important collections in the country, if not in the world. So things are not, if you want to know why I left Columbia, that's part of the reason. I, I think that the university began to uh, seriously neglect our region in, in favor of more fa fashionable uh, parts of the world. Um, and again, I, I'm in favor of African studies and Middle Eastern studies and South Asian studies, but it seemed to be viewed as a kind of zero-sum game, that if we built those programs um, up, we had to take away from old-fashioned, well-established, well-funded uh, programs, and um, that brings us to the European studies issue, but that's, a, that's something else I'll talk about. So here I am now in Arizona State University, where I was hired as, not as a Russianist, but as a chair. Um, as, by the way, next as of this fall, we'll have seven historians in my unit doing Russian and East European history. Seven. I don't know why we need that many in the middle of the desert, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we have them. <laughs> so, so it's nice to <laughs> have a community. I didn't feel I, I gave up as much as I, I was afraid I was going to. We even have some graduate students. Yes. Um, two years ago, uh, the um, president of the university uh, well, he didn't decide this directly himself, but be, it's sort of his fault, uh, who is a former associate provost at Columbia, by the way, Michael Crow. Um, he promotes uh, Arizona State University as a new American university. And one of the things that means is transdisciplinarity, whatever that may mean to whoever says it. Um, partly out of this intellectual commitment to transdisciplinarity, but um, I think mostly out of budget crunch, because we have a very stingy Republican dominated legislature, which I think would like to shut us down. And certainly the humanities units in the university, they don't like. I think we're doing, I mean, actually we've been um, compared by um, David Horowitz to Columbia for indoctrinating young minds with all sorts of leftist, feminist, multiculturalist ideologies. Arizona State University, believe it or not, yes we are. We are Columbia of the desert. Um, <laughs> so it gives you some sense of the political climate in which uh, we live. Um, we haven't, uh, so, uh, so, so two years ago, um, in the wisdom of the admin upper administration, they decided that being chair of the history department was not enough of a challenge for me, so 
um, they decided to put religious studies and philosophy together with history in a school, of which I, I wasn't even invited to be the director. I was just told I was the director. And because I was known to be such a trans, uh, sort of transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary person, I think I was called the, the transdisciplinary poster child, whatever that means. <laughs> Um, so I'm running this thing now, uh, sort of, trying to find ways of integrating what we do. And again, between history and religious studies, I, there's a lot that we have in common, um, primarily as hum hum humanists. Philosophy, you would think humanist too, but I, I really, we have a, a, a department that's full of people who do f something called philosophy of mind, which I only vaguely understand, even though I have to start writing tenure letters for these people soon. And then we have some feminist philosophers who I understand much better and some political philosophers, but the sort of the main trend is this philosophy of the mind and it's a very abstract, very inner looking group. So I, but the, the point of this is that humanities at Arizona State, as I think is the case across the country, if not the world, because I, uh, I thus fall went to Kiev, um, and not to Kiev, to Lviv, for the 10th anniversary conference celebration of something called the Mizhnarodnyatsatsya Gumanitariyev in Russian, uh, the International Association of Humanists, which was an ACLS, I mean, you, I think you heard from Andrzej Timoski probably told you a little bit about this initiative, an ACLS initiative to support human, humanity scholars in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And I gave the keynote address, which was called Humanities Under Siege, Arizona slash Ukraine. And I told them stories about what was going on with us in Arizona. <laughs> And the Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians couldn't believe it. They thought I was making all this up. <laughs> I said, no, I think we're much closer in situation now than we've been in a long time. And that's maybe a, a, a message on which to start. I, I kind of feel that, uh, especially coming from Arizona these days, um, and, and I'll tell you more about why that is the case, um, I, I feel we are not in a position to teach our colleagues in Eastern Europe and Russia about the world that we can learn together about a very difficult and challenging world as humanists, uh, social scientists, uh, to some lesser degree. So that's one of my messages of humility for the future of area studies. I think it's always been key. Uh, people who uh, don't have such a black and white view of the world, um, who, um, and again, the, the story that Engerman tells coming back to him is, is one where we, we had voices of descent to some of the more extreme positions that were articulated across the history of this field. And I don't, you know, I, I think people like Cohen sometimes um, exaggerated the, the totalitarian monster because the bigger the totalitarian monster, the more powerful you need a white knight to slay it, like Steve Cohen. And I am a good friend of Steve Cohen and we've discussed many of these things many, many times. But I, you know, I think the f the, the best people in our field have always been ones who uh, had empathy toward the cultures they were studying, who were even enthusiasm about the cultures they were studying. Um, although we did have uh, probably a higher degree of Russia haters or East European haters than, say, the China field. There's you know, a big asymmetry between Chinese studies, I think, or Far Eastern studies generally, and, and, and Russian East European studies, even in the Cold War context. So, what was my, the point of my, my Ukraine-Arizona comparison uh, in Lviv uh, last October? And I started by saying, I think we, we we're achieving some kind of negative convergence now, the two systems. Instead of Sakharov's hope that we would take the best from each of our systems uh, over time, I, I think we, I mean, in Arizona now, we have a wall, you know, <laughs> separating our country from another country. We have a law that allows people to be picked up if they don't have documents. Um, and that's just the beginning uh, of, of what we've taken from, and of course the airport security regime I think is now worse than I ever remember it being in the old Soviet days. Uh, so we've taken a lot of bad things from our understanding of the Soviet model. Uh, this, the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Uzbeks have taken I think some of the worst things from us. Some sort of casino capitalism or mafia capitalism, whatever you want to call it, uh, a kind of degradation of culture to the, the basis, kind of consumerist, uh, materialist, uh, 
whatever you want to call it, values I don't want to say, but um, if you watch TV today over there, I mean, I, I lament our TV, but then I go there and I see it could even be worse, yes. Um, although, you know, there are, there are of course, um, bright spots everywhere, um, but, uh, uh, but in general, what we've taken from each other has not been the best. Uh, so that's why I say we have negative convergence of anything un un unintentionally. Another thing that I, I highlighted was the degree to which some of the core disciplines that make up area studies, and I believe that to be language teaching and culture, uh, history, um, have uh, a very precarious position in most large research universities, but even in smaller teaching colleges. Uh, we are at the mercy of uh, cost cost-benefit analysis uh, in which uh, universities talk more and more in very corporatist terms about efficiencies and productivities and um, where requirements are adjusted in such a way that um, uh, the best career opportunities seem to be in business and despite you know the last several years of Wall Street crash and God knows what else, um, for some reason business considers to be a popular major, an unreflected popular major, you know, as if we just keep on going down that path to the abyss. Um, and uh, and sciences, which have very high budgets and very big lab expenses and get very big grants, are the parts of the universities that get the most attention from administration. Again, I say, my, as, as president and past president of, of the Slavic Association, I've written many letters to university presidents decrying their cutting back on language enrollment, on language uh, departments funding um, in vain, I have to say, so far. I mean, St SUNY Albany didn't listen to us. Florida didn't listen to us. I don't know, Louisiana didn't listen to us. So they just keep cutting languages. And how America can think of itself as a world power uh, and continue to narrow the, the range of language proficiencies that our students and citizens uh, will command is beyond me, but that's a bigger problem. Uh, and in general, knowledge about the rest of the world. I mean, I, I really uh, think that area studies, I mean, most recently it's under threat from uh, federal budget cuts. I mean, Title VI is pretty much wiped out now. All the, all the uh, money that came from the federal government through the Department of Education to support uh, regional study centers across the country, many of which you read about in the Engerman book, um, will be um, scrambling for new resources to keep going what they had going. And also for, again, administrative attention. I mean, if they don't have even that money that they're bringing in now, um, I think administrators will say, well, we have to think even harder about whether we want to continue supporting this kind of expensive uh, multidisciplinary activity. Um, Title VIII is still, I think, holding on for dear life. So the National Council for Eurasian and East European Research will uh, probably continue, although with Bob Huber's death recently, that's also uh, up for grabs. I was, I was on the uh, board of the NICS here when we replaced the old Tumanov CIA <coughs> administration with Bob. And I know how hard it was to find someone of his qualifications to uh, take over this organization. And I think he's taken it in ways that um, we hadn't dreamed of, but, but uh, that future for that is, is also uh, up for grabs. So with the outside money uh, not so generous as it was, once was, and, and with university administrations generally preferring other priorities um, that bring in big money, um, again, knowledge about the rest of the world seems to be up for grabs. Uh, at a time when we claim that we're sort of continuing to play a more enlightened and humble role in the world, but with less and less qualified people to do that. So that's, again, my, uh, my perspective on from, from Arizona, that since I've left C Columbia. Uh, besides the seven historians that we have uh, between history and religious studies, uh, we just hired, as I mentioned, um, a, a recent, I mean, not, not so recent po Columbia PhD uh, in Russian literature. We have a person doing Russian politics. We have a uh, fairly distinguished 
economist of Russia, Joseph Breda. We have someone doing history of theater, history of music. Um, and then we have a, a summer language program, the Critical Language Institute, which brings every summer to Arizona State University, God, God bless them, 150 students from all across the country with full fellowship to study 12 languages. And we hire teachers, among some of them coming from Colombia's uh, uh, instructor population, but also from Uzbekistan, from Tatarstan, from Armenia, from Georgia. So it's, it's really quite exciting time to be there in the summer if you can take the heat, which not everybody can. Um, so uh, again, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by what uh, there is at Arizona State University as a kind of sign of the success of area studies. Um, that even out there, which wasn't one of the big title, we never had Title VI uh, center status there. Um, we do have, we do have uh, private money, uh, a, a very lovely Armenian-American couple, the Malikians, whose sons both went to Arizona State University, have endowed the Malikian Center uh, with a $2 million fund to, to promote knowledge about our region and, and they're sort of Armenians who actually like Turkish studies and Persian studies instead of other kinds of Armenians we could name. I know one of you is doing an Armenian project so I don't have to explain anything to you. Um, but this is a very cosmopolitan Armenian couple and they um, are very generous and very undemanding uh, but very, very good to us. So we've got a kind of a little side budget to, to bring in people and have conferences and collaborate with other units. Um, back to the question of team teaching. And again, this comes back to the question of humility. I think not everyone is prepared to be comfortable in a team teaching situation. It, it requires letting down some of your defenses um, because you're in the presence of someone who knows something, a lot about something that you don't know. And um, you're not sure that what you know covers up for that. <laughs> and, and yet, I, I think both for students' uh, excitement and, and sense of what academic and intellectual exchange is all about, and for us faculty members, um, it's a wonderful opportunity, a way to learn uh, materials that you, or ideas that you have, have not had a chance to do so on your own. Um, I've taken this team teaching thing with me to in, uh, Arizona State too. Uh, where it's a little harder to do because we're a state university and everything is kind of more carefully scrutinized in terms of budgets and how many students we have in our courses. But I've, uh, since I've been at Arizona State, I've taught one new course every year at the graduate level. Um, and they've all involved team teaching. One is called War and Revolution, in which I taught uh, a, together with our senior China, modern China specialist who, I mean, I happen to be working for the last 15 years on the Russian, German, Austrian occupation of Ukraine and sort of the borderlands between Russia and Germany in World War I. He's been working on the Japanese occupation of China in World War II, so it's a very nice um, complement. We actually learn from each other without even trying. And then the students, um, I think, also see that we're having fun with ideas and, and research and scholarship. And we had students from all walks of life, uh, some political scientists, some anthropologists, mostly historians, and not by, by, we can't afford to have a course just for Russianist or Chinese historians at Arizona State. So there, although there were some of those in the class, it was, they were minority. And we are appealing to um, students in American history or Latin American history or Middle East history. Uh, another course I taught was comparative colonialisms, and that was with uh, a very good friend of mine and colleague now who um, is a specialist on Southeast Asian history. So it's kind of the British, French, Dutch, Japanese empires in Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, um, Vietnam. We compared with Russians in Central Asia, Russians in the Caucasus, Russians in Ukraine. And it was really, again, the same thing. The Russianists were definitely minority, uh, as were the Southeast Asian specialists. And it was a, a big class, of graduate class 22, which included people who were not just historians and certainly not historians of our region. So that's another, um, I mean, again, it's a risk for the faculty, above all, uh, who might be exposed as not knowing as much as they were supposed to know. But I, I, I think if you can get over that, and again, I, I think not everyone maybe is made 
to feel comfortable in those situations, but more people could be than I think currently are, and, and I do think it's, it's good for ped pedagogy. So team teaching uh, as part of this interdisciplinary or you know, at least trans-regional trans -regional approach. I haven't talked with anybody in, in literature yet, but Hilda and I are, are plotting something for the future. Um, I, I guess since you, um, another, another, uh, another thing which may not be evident from my biography, which I, I think was important for me in kind of um, learning how to work with colleagues in Russia, Ukraine, Poland in particular, um, was uh, a coincidence, I mean, a, a chance um, meeting with a neighbor of mine at, at a Columbia apartment building. Uh, who was working for something called Primary Source Microfilms, uh, which is a branch of the Gale Group, which in turn is a branch of the Thompson Empire of publishers and reference materials. And somewhere back in the early 90s, they got in their heads that they were going to go to Russia and discover the archival gold mines there and make some money out of them. And I always had my doubts about it. I still have my doubts after 10 years of having consulted with them. But it was a really wonderful opportunity for me to go over and meet the directors of many, many archives where I never would have worked. Um, I mean, I, I do like to go work in archives, but I only have had experience in two or three uh, in Russia and then one in Ukraine in my, in my life. Uh, so I got to meet dozens of directors of archives in Russia, Ukraine, and eventually Poland with the aim of learning about their collections uh, with the further aim of creating microfilms of those, of the gems of those collections, which would be sold to American and European and Japanese, and even Russian, if they could ever afford it, libraries and other kind of research centers for uh, scholarly use. And it was a very, uh, I mean, I, I, I learned an awful lot about the way Soviet archives had been set up and the sort of the attitudes of Soviet archivists, um, but also about American businessmen, which I had less experience with <laughs> than Soviet archives. And their ideas of what would make money and how to market these things. And it took a lot of, I mean, I, I kind of felt myself in the role of a, a cultural mediator between the Soviet archive officials and, and the American business people. I, and I, I tended to feel more sympathy with the Soviet archive people, <laughs> uh, more, even though I was being paid by the American corporation to, to do their, their bidding. Uh, and there were so many, uh, many lessons I learned, but uh, one was a very different approach, uh, the different approaches that, you know, I, I kind of think I adopted a Soviet or a Russian approach to what to do with archives, um, which I had to try to educate the American corporate people who were not Russia specialists by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, to be able to appreciate why negotiations were often very difficult. This is, you know, at a time when Russian archives and Ukrainian archives were starved of resources themselves. They were recovering from a, a, a shock therapy in which they lost money for heating, for staff, for security, for just about anything. So we came at a time with the promise of $10,000 advances for any publication contract, which was a lot of money. Uh, those had a lot of money. Uh, so people kind of wanted the money, but they were afraid of what it came with, and I, 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 was a f I shared some of their fears. Be um, I mean, they, there was an attitude of they were gonna pl that these Western companies are going to come plunder their archival resources. Um, and again, the, the sort of standard way that Soviet archivists worked was if they published anything from their archives, it was hardbound. It was in a scholarly edition with all kinds of essays in the beginning explaining the origins of the documents and the context of the documents with lots of annotations along the way with indexes in the back. And here they were just going to expect it to give over th tens of thousands of their documents to be microfilmed with a vague sort of finding aid at the beginning, but that's it. On the assumption that American scholars don't need all this kind of guidance from experts. <laughs> And we could just go find things in these collections, which was a, which I never agreed with, and I still don't agree with. But we have these collections out there. The, the archives are in much better condition as a result of the money that they got from these contracts. Um, I have great friends in the archival administration now, and if, and if you need connections in any number of archives, <laughs> I think I still know the directors well enough to get you in. But it was, 
again, an experience in which you know, the arrogance of the American business people who, who knew nothing about the region. And, every, and then, of course, the other problem is that they would have a turnover and some kind of merger and acquisition every three years. So all the people who I'd educated <laughs> that time were gone and replaced by some new crew who knew even less than the last group. So it was a very frustrating thing. And, and they were frustrated by the Russians because the Russians were trying to be very careful. They, and, and you know, the Russian archives are state archives, so they, they fall under federal law. And um, anything they do that's financial has to be cleared by any number of expertise. And, and the American side thought that was just you know, typical Soviet totalitarian bureaucracy. And I said, mm -hmm. OK. Um, no, it wasn't uh, just that. Uh, I mean, sometimes it was that too, but most of the time it wasn't. I'd also like to um, talk about another, uh, I mean, these are somewhat unrelated and maybe two random associations for you, but I'll try to make that all make sense at some point. Um, my own IRIX experience, uh, since IRIX experiences seem to be an important part of this. Um, I, I went uh, as a graduate student from Stanford University uh, with the dissertation topic, um, which became my book about kind of political education in the Red Army in the 1920s. Why did I come up with this? Many people ask me why did I come up with this topic, especially Russian friends of mine. Um, and the idea was that in the Red Army, um, the Bolsheviks confronted their peasant population. They couldn't look away from who the peasants were. And they wanted to use the army. They thought the army as a captive audience would be a good place to turn these ill-educated and sometimes illiterate peasants into at least Red Army soldiers, if not Soviet citizens, and maybe even Communist Party members. That was the, the big ambition. And they did a lot of work to do this. Uh, uh, and so it was kind of a study of education and culture in the army, above all, and the confrontation of, of Bolsheviks with their radical urban modernist vision and their overwhelmingly rural conscript population of peasants. So one of those eternal Russian history questions, peasants and elites and backwardness and modernity and all that sort of thing. Um, my main advisor, who you have read about in Ingram II, Alexander Dahlin, tried to talk me out of this topic early on, saying that he thought it was too risky because the Red Army was headed by a certain Trotsky for most of the 1920s, or at least half the 1920s, and that that would get me in trouble. There would be no archives that would be open to me, about which he was right, um, and that I would just antagonize them. And if anything could have been done on this topic, it would have been done by now by someone else. But I was stubborn, uh, and I, I usually got along very well with Alex Dahlin, and, and I, this wasn't, there wasn't a source of any conflict. I, I persisted, and I um, got my IREX thing. Uh, this was a particularly fraught time in US-Soviet relations. I think Reagan had, or was about to call it the empire of evil, and <laughs> it was Afghanistan. The Afghan war and, and relations were bad, and there were several calls for boycotting the exchange that year altogether. American scholars who wanted to boycott the exchange because of human rights violations, because of the war in Afghanistan. So those of us who were slotted to go that year uh, were encouraged to find alternatives just in case things didn't work. So I had a Fulbright waiting for me also to go to Paris and Berlin in case Moscow didn't work out. Well, we, the first group of IREX uh, fellows were approved by the Soviet side, and six of us were not on the list, me being one of them. So we didn't hear another three months, and then finally in three months they said, we might let von Hagen in and what, two others, but um, we don't know if we can get him a visa in time. So I, I, I came two months later than the rest of the IREX group in the end because of um, holdups on the Soviet side. Um, and, I, and again, I knew I was asking for trouble talking about the Red Army in the 1920s. Um, but, you know, figured what the hell, <laughs> I could <laughs> we'll try it. I was supposed to go to Moscow for the year. That's what I said in my application. That's what they told me when they approved me. But then I got to Moscow, and uh, no one was waiting for me at the airport. 
this was back in the days when you needed people to meet you in the airport because you weren't supposed to have foreign currency. And so how were you supposed to get anywhere if you didn't have foreign currency? So there was nobody waiting for me either from IREX or from the embassy or from Inadil. And it was late at night and I thought, well, I got to get to MGU. I know I have to go to MGU. So there was a you know, taxi, well, not a really taxi driver, well, you're one of those unofficial, unofficial people who said, where do you need to go? in Russian, and I said to MGU, and he said, well, let's go. And I said, well, I don't have any money. He said, what do you mean you don't have any money? I said, I don't have any rubles. He said, what do you have? Dollars. I said, okay, that will do. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I already, I barely crossed, I barely crossed customs and passport control, and I've been corrupted with <laughs> offers that could get me in trouble. So, and then the taxi ride, once we kind of did that, and I got in this taxi, and he took me to MGU, he gave me this tour of Moscow, which I had never had before. Show me where the prostitutes were hanging out. Show me. I said, oh my goodness, this is not the Moscow I was used to from my CIEE days. And he got me to MGU where I was told I wasn't on the list there. But I fortunately saw the American starosta, who was a Stanford student too, who said, oh yeah, Mark's supposed to be here, but he's not really supposed to be here. He just didn't get the instructions that he was supposed to go to Leningrad instead. <laughs> and they apparently decided this while I was flying across the ocean. But I decided, what am I going to do in Leningrad? There's <laughs> no archives there for me. And not that I thought I was going to get in, but so I fought with them for a week with Inatiel and told them that if they sent, if they didn't let me stay in Moscow for some time, I was going to go home and I was going to make a protest, and one of theirs was going to come home, because IRIX didn't do anything for me. I have to say, IRIX was a spineless organization in this sense, and I lost that fight at the first stage. And so I was sent to Leningrad after a week. <coughs> where the only thing I could really do was work in the Library of uh, Academy, the Academy of Sciences and read dissertation abstracts, which was, which was a good thing. But um, because Leningrad didn't have, I mean, the kind of military history collections that I was counting on in Moscow, it was a little bit of treading water up there. And, and I mean, I, I was happy to be back in Leningrad. It was my first city that I fell in love with in, in the Soviet Union on my CIE programs in, in the old days. Um, but I needed to be in Moscow, and I fought with them every week. I would go and fight with them, and finally they let me go back to Moscow for the second half of the year, and I got a lot more work done in the Lenin Library in particular. While I was in Leningrad, however, or when I got to Leningrad, apparently they weren't ready for me either. Um, and I went to Inadiel the first day I got there, and again, no one met me at the train station, no one <laughs> bothered to show me anywhere around. I, thank goodness I had been there before and, and, and wasn't intimidated by Soviet reality. Uh, I made my way to the dormitory on Shevchenko Street, which seems to be a little providential now. Um, and um, they were waiting for me there at the dormitory at least, thank goodness. But when I went to Inatiel, they said they hadn't found an, uh, an, um, an advisor for me yet in any department, so there was no place they could assign me, and that was a very big concern, where to put me in the university at, at El Geu. So I said, well, you don't have anybody who does the 1920s or the Civil War in Soviet history? I mean, they're kind of foundational periods in Soviet history. You would think every major respectable Soviet history department would have, no, we don't have anyone who can work with you. So they, they went through something called the Historia Sovietskova Obshistva Department, which was the history of Soviet society. Then they couldn't find anybody there who wanted to work with me. Then they moved to Historia KPSS, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, still in the history department, in the history faculty. Couldn't find anybody there who knew Civil War or <laughs> the 1920s. Um, and finally, um, they were getting despairing, and they said, the only department we have left, but we haven't contacted them yet, is Historia Kapss Venia Historiska Fakultieta. So this is the people who teach Marxism-Leninism to earth scientists, but not historians. These are not, it's not in the history department proper. So there's a whole separate, what I came to see as catechism department, having been brought up Catholic. So they said, I haven't got anybody there. So I just said, I would just go there. I was just, I was tired of this, and I don't know what, what, what I think I'd read Bulgakov the year before, so I was full of, full of fierce energy and pseudo-courage. And I said, I understand you guys have a, an advisor for me here. And um, they said, oh, who, who are you and where did you come from? And an American showing up, and this is 80, 1982 in Leningrad, which is you know, sort of last year of Brezhnev. Um, 
about which they, I can tell you a story too if we have time, but I'm not sure we do. Um, so they said, well, we, no, we know nothing about this, and Inatiel usually tells us that what to do. So I said, well, I, I, this is what I do, and I was told I was supposed to have an advisor here, and I was sent from Moscow because they didn't have any advisors there. So, um, so they said, well, come back tomorrow, but go see Inadiel first. <laughs> so I went to Inadiel, and they said, oh, we understand you went on your own to the department, and, and were asking for an advisor. I said, well, I, I'm kind of getting desperate. You know, I don't have all my life to live. You know, I, I came here for a number of months, and I need to get working. So they um, said, well, we did find someone for you. I said, good. And it's in that history of CPSU, non-history department, de department. And he actually works on the 1920s. He uh, writes books about uh, international workers' exchanges in the 1920s. And then they said to me in, in Russian, only one thing is we we're a little worried about, on Nizriachi. And I said, does that mean he's blind? And I said, yes. They said yes, and I said, hmm, the history oriented of the Communist Party who's blind. So, <laughs> that was the beginning of my adventure <laughs> in Leningrad. And I turned, this guy's name was Mikhail Sergeyevich Kuzmin. Uh, he was indeed blind since World War II when he had been a naval officer, and, and according to him, his story, uh, was poison, alcohol poison, in Port Arthur or somewhere in Manchuria at the end of the war and gave up his naval career and decided what could he do as a blind man but do history of the party. <laughs> and I, I don't think he had any idea how, how ironic that sounded to an American. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we got along well. But the, before, before we could go any further, he wanted me to write a historiographical essay about my topic so that he knew what I was doing and how he could help me. So I went to one of my Russian friends who was a, uh, ideological secretary in his local party cell, and he helped me translate my topic into sort of Sovietese. It became Politra Botov Krasnaya Army, 1920s, which was what it was really about. It was political work in the Red Army. And that's, I, I hoped that that would be something, since they had books of documents published on that subject, I hoped that's something that would be um, both comprehensible and acceptable. So I went to back to Kuzmin, and he in front of, we had, he didn't have his own office, we sat in the departmental office with all sorts of graduate students and young faculty walking past us. Well, he interrogated me about my essay. First he said, um, you mentioned here peasant culture, and I'm wondering if you ever read Lenin on the peasants. <laughs> I said, yes, and he said, no, what did Lenin say about the peasants? Well, there were the poor peasants and the middle peasants, that, so there's no peasant culture. This is an SR, a social revolutionary, Anthropologic, bourgeois anthropological concept that you know, we don't recognize. He says, okay, so, am I right? And then he wanted to know why I hadn't mentioned Trotsky in my proposal, or any Trotskyists. As you know, there were Trotskyists running the Red Army in the beginning of the 20s. I said, I know, I know, but I, my advisor told me that it was best just to leave this out so as not to provoke anybody, antagonize anybody, and that you people you know, kind of have sensitivities about Trotsky still. I said, nonsense. We have, <laughs> at this university, we have a committee to fight right-wing deviationism uh, and Trotskyism. And uh, we have people who know a lot about Trotsky, and I, I would encourage you to go to this. And I said, okay, I never went. Um, but we became kind of friends over the, over the semester, and he actually tried to help, because it turns out that he had trained almost every party historian in Leningrad, people who were the directors of the museum at the Kazan Cathedral, the, Atheism and Religion Museum, people at the party of the October Revolution Museum in Leningrad. So he had people everywhere, Komsomol. He tried to get me into an archive, desperately, I think. Even he, with his, I think, probably solid Stalinist credentials, um, couldn't do anything for me in those days. And so I ended up never seeing an archive. Um, about the Red Army and, and relying entirely on, on published sources, which, which for the 1920s was not such a problem as it would have been for later periods because in the 1920s the, the Bolsheviks were still very proud of what they were doing in the Red Army and, and published a lot about it. Ironically, in 1990 when uh, the archival world was changing, uh, I finally got into the Russian State Military Archive, which is the old Soviet Army Archive, and the archivists who were there describing collections that they were just recently declassifying for the first time and didn't know about those collections asked me 
to help them <laughs> describe the collections of the political administration of the Red Army. It was kind of a poetic justice, <laughs> finally. And, and, and since then, I've been one of their you know, favorite archival historians, and they bring me things I don't even ask for, which is, which is all good. Okay. So that's, that's my IREC story and how I, uh, how I succeeded despite what I was told not to do by my advisors and <laughs> IREX and all sorts of other people. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, one of the things I noticed about your biographies here is, uh, and again, this is completely unrelated to what I was just talking about, but, but maybe not, is many of you are not in positions um, of um, sorry, tenured positions uh, in departments that are recognized as sort of area studies kind of departments. Many of you are archivists and museum curators and, and doing all sorts of other things. And uh, one of the things that I have come to appreciate since moving to Arizona is something called public history, which is uh, an alternative track um, which mainstream historians can uh, dip into and even get a certificate in if they want, but you can also get a PhD in public history, which I understand after four years of learning about this program, because we're one of the oldest uh, programs and biggest <coughs> programs in the country, is designed for people who are not intending to go into um, standard mainstream academic positions of teaching in research universities. Uh, so we are preparing people to work in archives, to work in museums, to work in historical societies, to be documentary film consultants, to be scholarly publishers even. We have a scholarly publishing program within the public history program. And again, coming from Columbia to Arizona State, um, I think I had colleagues in the history department who I would call public historians. Eric Foner, who works a lot with the National Park Service, or Ken Jackson, who ran the City Museum of New York for many years, who, who do take their own scholarly research and their scholarly background to a much bigger audience. And it's, it's a question of a, you know, adjusting to a different audience than the academic audience. But I don't think either Ken Jackson or Eric Foner would ever call himself a public historian because that, for some reason, has some kind of bad odor among real historians, at least at Columbia. Of course, we didn't train our graduate students to do anything at Columbia in the realm of this sort of non-academic career. And I think that's a, a mistake. I think a lot of people who go into history might not want to be professors of history at Columbia or Arizona State for that matter, but might still want to do history. And, um, and, and that model of public history uh, is, is one that, by the way, at least our university administration understands very well because it's kind of social impact, it's public outreach, it's community networking, all kinds of things which they like. Um, and it shows that scholars can talk to ordinary people about what they do with some use and effect, impact and, and benefit. And I think, you know, so a lot of um, the AAAS as it was and now the ACES as it is, um, has been primarily focused on people in university positions. And, and again, the library thing took, took, I don't know how many years before we got a library prize um, in the history of the organization's existence. But it's, I mean, we have a lot of people doing area studies of one kind or another who are not in university positions, or at least not in permanent university positions. So I think we might reach out to better. Uh, I mean, at, at Columbia, we, we came up with a, a master's in regional studies, which was in part designed to uh, reach out to these people and help them um, upgrade their skills uh, in the different disciplines with a two-year degree. It's a two-year degree, I think. Um, so we, I mean, there are initiatives like this, but I, I think um, uh, area studies needs to go in, in, in more in that direction. Okay, I think I'm still going to talk about the disciplinary issue but briefly, and, I, and then Ed reminded me that I promised to talk about nationalities and non-Russians and things like that. <clears throat> and I will do that. Um, going back to Engerman's uh, treatment of, of things, um, I mean, I think in the case, one of, I think our biggest problem in area studies, frankly, has been political science <laughs> as a discipline. 
and I don't mean all political scientists, um, but, uh, and I mean certain historically recent trends in political science, uh, the quantitative uh, rational choice um, taken to extreme um, view of the world that basically doesn't need to see the world or doesn't need to know much about the world uh, but needs to know numbers and, and the only sort of real problems that are worth studying are those that have numbers attached to them. Um, political science wasn't always that way. I mean, I, again, since I worked on civil military relations in the Red Army in my early days, um, a lot of the literature I read was political sociology or political science uh, and I, you know, when, when people in political science were kind of comparative historians at some remove, or at least that's the way we historians viewed them. And that changed. I, I, I wouldn't read most books that come out in political science because I couldn't understand them because I don't have the mathematical skills to go through all of their graphs and charts. And I, and I also am not convinced that they're grappling with problems that I care about <laughs> in the real world because they're all trying to test some kind of new thesis or hypothesis that is generated by some literature which has nothing to do with our part of the world. And I, the, I've tried to understand the roots of this problem because I started out as an international relations person as an undergraduate and took a lot of political science. And again, like I can say I learned a lot from old, the older kind of political science and lamented their running away from us. Um, they claim, of course, that we become irrelevant because they're the, they're the ones who join the, the disciplinary mainstream. Um, but I, I, you know, I think wherever I look, and that's tr it's been reconfirmed at Arizona State, the discipline of political science has run away from the humanities. And uh, in whoring after economics, which I think um, they think is the more prestigious and more scientific uh, role model for the discipline. So that explains a lot of the statistics and the rational choice theory domination. Again, fortunately, at Arizona State University, we have a, a political science department that believes in quali qualitative methods, which I was very relieved to know, and, and actually thinks people should know about parts of the world uh, other than the United States. Uh, and again, th this rational choice sort of thing <coughs> works best on American politics, where American elections have been studied for you know decades now. Um, and you know, we can study elections, obviously, in other places, but that hasn't always been the most reliable piece of evidence for understanding uh, a political system or a political economy. Besides political science, economics has kind of deserted area studies um, as they moved more fully into the handmaiden of Wall Street um, service. And uh, comparative economics and economic history are uh, rarities in economic departments. Uh, sometimes you would find them in a history department, sometimes uh, elsewhere. On the other hand, a couple of disciplines have re-emerged since the end of the Soviet Union and the Soviet era, um, which have somewhat made up the slack for the fleeing of, of political science and economics, and that's sociology and anthropology. And especially, in, you find more work these days being done on political economy by anthropologists, who, by the way, share certain area studies prejudices with us, like you should learn the language, you might go live over there and <laughs> um, get to know the people, even their contemporary forms, even if you're studying history. So I think anthropology has replaced political science for at least historians as our new social science ally, especially social cultural anthropology, but other, other kinds as well. And sociology too, I mean, uh, Ingerman suggested that Sociology was not completely dead in the Soviet Union or in the Eastern Bloc as, say, economics or political science and our understanding of them was. Um, and even uh, ethnography, even though it was not the same thing as anthropology, didn't take too long uh, to kind of adjust to uh, new standards after the Soviet Union or new paradigms and new uh, international collaborative communities. So I think, you know, we, we, and one of the things that Engerman doesn't talk about is, is how sociology and anthropology have really come back full blown and where um, the, the American Anthropological Association meetings have numerous panels every year dealing with our part of the world, 
Uh, and again, probably because they're dealing with identity and ethnicity and community and conflict and all those sorts of things, they, they find our part of the world um, highly productive for generating their own theoretical speculations about the world, their own theory within the discipline, uh, which political science seems to have not quite figured out how to do yet in the post-Soviet world. So again, I, I, I think you know, we, we're at an, a stage, and again, I'm hoping that this sort of rational choice, overly quantitative fetishism of political science will dissipate with time, will wane, and there are signs of it that, you know, that, that fad has kind of reached its peak and people want other kind of specialists in their political science departments than just these number crunching types. Um, but it's going to be a while and, and it's, and it's a, a kind of a matter of prestige now and um, et cetera. Um, history, as it was suggested, um, had something of a, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I feel fortunate, I'm, I'm not saying glad I'm a historian, but I feel fortunate that I chose history at this particular moment in history because I think it was historians, I mean, at least in my experience, who um, were able to learn the most from our Russian and Ukrainian and Polish colleagues Partly because we did, and you, you read about Zajnczkowski uh, uh, in, in the history chapter, who was an advisor to my advisor, Terry Emmons, um, and to many other uh, imperial historians, and who um, offered one of several, I think, links already in the Soviet days between American and, and German and European historical community and the Russian community. Uh, we read the same classics, we kind of thought about Russia in very similar ways. So when the end of the Soviet era came, um, it was much easier for historians across the borders to talk to one another. We didn't, and we did have, you know, all of our Western schools of historical thought in our heads from graduate school, but I don't think we ever were guilty of imposing Western models on our historical colleagues in Russia, U Ukraine, Poland. And again, I, those are the three that I spend the most time in, so that's why I keep on saying them. It's not as if they're the only ones that matter. Um, but those are the ones I know the best. And uh, whereas political scientists just came in with the attitude that whatever the Russians or the Ukrainians had done was nothing, it was, it, it was worse than nothing, and had to be completely remade in an American sort of rational choice model. And um, I, I attended several summer schools in, in Russia, uh, mostly in provincial Russian cities, that brought together historians, political scientists, anthropologists, mostly native ones, but also ones from imported abroad, like me, to um, uh, sort of help um, sort of middle level Russian, Ukrainian, post-Soviet scholars and teachers raised their qualification levels uh, so they could get better pay when they went back to their universities or, or, or colleges. And um, the most productive uh, interchanges came from anthropologists and historians, uh, in my experience. And I think that, again, goes back to this question of, of, of sort of humility, that we didn't assume we knew everything that, that, that we had everything to teach the Russians and they had nothing to teach us. Um, and, and my publication record has been uh, you know, evidence of this. I, uh, one of my first co-edited books was um, um, called Kazan, Moscow, St. Petersburg, which uh, was done with scholars in St. Petersburg, Moscow, Kazan, Berkeley, Columbia, etc. Uh, another one was the Russian-Ukrainian volume, which also involved Russian, Ukrainian, Canadian, American, German scholars. Um, and the most recent one, the Russian Empire, again, was a Ford Foundation sponsored project, which involved conference meetings in New York, Samara, uh, Omsk, not, was it Omsk I went to? I think it was Omsk, um, and, and Moscow. Uh, starting in Yaroslavl. So again, I, I, um, I think historians were able to make the transition in some ways better, and, uh, and I, I think that might explain in part why uh, historians played uh, 
a much more visible role in the, in the transition years than we might otherwise have done. Literature, again, to you, the chapter on literature kind of was a little stopped short in history um, with kind of the, the, the good old golden days, golden age. But literature uh, has also, uh, whenever humanities are allowed to prosper, also prospered and continued to move in all kinds of exciting new directions, uh, cultural studies, post-colonialism. Um, and again, at Columbia, we um, tried some experiments to um, uh, Gayatri Spivak, undergrad Gayatri Spivak's uh, Aegis, the sort of guru of post-colonialism. Um, she decided to attack the English department, her own department, and its stubborn insistence on holding monopoly on the notion of comparative literature and broke it out of the English department um, so that now Slavic, French and German, Spanish, Italian uh, literature departments are in dialogue with the area studies institutes and with some of the social science uh, departments as well in an, a new kind of attempt to break out of um, the old comparative literature paradigms. Uh, but, but she herself cites Renee Wellick um, and, and the Yale, the whole Yale School of Comparative Literature as an inspiration for her own work. So, and she took a very great, I mean, one of the reasons I got involved in this as director of the Herman Institute at the time was because she was very interested in Central Asia and its kind of post-colonial uh, aspects um, for her own work as an Indian scholar of European uh, culture or whatever, whatever it is that she does. I'm not, not always sure. Um, I'm not always sure I understand what she does. So one of the lessons I think from there is that one of the best ways, I'm not saying it's the only way, for area studies scholars to defend their case. And I think we increasingly are in that position of having to defend what we do against people who have other claims on resources is to collaborate with our other area studies colleagues, um, the world. Because I mean, for a lot of us, if you count all the people who do Far East and East Asia and Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, Middle East, Latin America, and we all share this you know, at some level, culture-based commitment to knowing uh, more about culture and language and, uh, than, um, than seems to be the norm for American education and American politics. And, <coughs> um, and we can form strategic alliances, I think, that allow us to do maybe not the same things that we used to do, maybe some different things, but to keep doing some things um, that we value and, and that we share with more and more. And again, one of the things about being the director of one of these schools that I never asked to be director of and never thought about having a school of history, philosophy, and religious studies is that I, I, I'm starting to understand better what we as humanists um, do share uh, in, as, as methods, as uh, sort of orientations to the world, towards students, toward teaching, towards research. And uh, there's a lot there. Uh, I mean, even though I don't always understand what the philosophers are telling me what they do, but, but I know it's good stuff and, and we, sh we should keep it uh, in, our, in our academic worlds. So that's the, the matter of the disciplines. I, 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 mean, I, I, I lament the departure of political science from its pro former role in, in area studies. And believe me, you know, as at Columbia, I worked very closely with Bialer and Goldman, uh, Schuldman and, and um, Legvold, and was on several PhD dissertations every year for political scientists. So I, it's not that I speak of this from some sort of, you know, alien uh, world that knows nothing about what they do there. Uh, and I tried to, you know, understand as best I could uh, what they did and why they were doing it. But I think there was a kind of sort of mob fad mentality that took them off in some unfortunate direction, which I, I hope they're coming back from slowly too. And again, we do have anthropology and sociology now, so, so we don't have to miss them too much uh, uh, if they don't want to come back to us. Um, now I'd like to turn to the empire, colonialism, nationalities issue. Uh, again, about, I guess about 15 years ago, I decided that for me to be a decent Soviet historian, it was not enough to know just about Russia and Russians. Since, um, 
I knew from my very first trip to the Soviet Union as a CIE student way back in 1975 that there was this place called Georgia where they didn't speak Russian and it was a little bit different from Moscow and in, in Leningrad. Even Tallinn we visited and I knew that wasn't quite the same. And even Kiev, which is a little more complicated about whether it's the same or different, um, was not Moscow and, and, and Leningrad. And, and I, I think that must have saddened me from the very beginning that I needed to know something more about these other places in order to understand even what Russia was and who Russians were and when, where Russia started and began. So eventually I got around to doing that. And, and again, during the course of my research on the Red Army, I, I discovered a whole swath of materials about Ukrainianization in the Red Army in the 1920s. And I left it out of my book because I didn't know what to do with it at that time. But I've got it in boxes somewhere. You'll, you'll soon, well, someday you'll see it if you want to look for it. Um, and I decided I, <coughs> I really needed to understand how Russia worked as an empire, the Soviet Union worked as an empire. And I fished around for which nationality I should strategically f focus on. I started studying Turkish here as a faculty member and I studied Turkish for two years and officially I'm proficient in Turkish but I think I've forgotten most everything I know. Um, but at least I, I, I kind of can read things uh, up to a, a limit and I, and I learned a bit of Ottoman history and Turkish history. But then I decided since I already had Polish as my second language from, from graduate school in literature, um, and Russian was my primary language, it shouldn't be too hard to learn Ukrainian, which was sort of in between as far as I understood. <laughs> and that's partly true, but it's also very not true. And I realized I really did have to study Ukrainian to be able to speak and understand Ukrainian rather than just assuming like, like many Russians today that because they know a few lines of Shevchenko or some joke in Ukrainian that they understand Ukrainian. Uh, and it's not really that much different from, from a dialect of Russian. So after I went through a period of Ukrainianization, uh, self-Ukrainianization, I um, wanted to stay with my sort of military theme and sort of the role of soldiers and, and ethnic identity among soldiers both in the Imperial Army and then the Soviet Army, especially leading up to this Ukrainianization experience, experiment of the 1920s. Um, and um, so I started consulting with, and I was put in touch with people uh, who, who could educate me in this. The first reaction uh, of my Russian history colleagues to this move was basically to accuse me of being a Mazepite or a Pitlurite or a Benderite, um, that I somehow was betraying the Russian motherland by taking up this, this provincial colony of the Russian Empire. And I kept on saying, no, I'm, I'm, I still consider myself a Russianist, but if anything, I'm learning better what Russia is and who Russians are by studying who Ukrainians are and what Ukraine is and when Ukraine starts and ends. But that, uh, so I, I, on the one hand, the Russian Russianists, both American Russianists and Russian Russianists viewed me as a traitor, you know, equivalent to Mazeppa, I think, if they, if they knew who Mazeppa was. Um, and the reaction from the Ukrainian community, the Ukrainian scholarly community, and I talk mostly about the diaspora North American uh, Ukrainian community, was one of guarded um, caution. It was good that von Hagen, who had been a Russianist, is now discovering the beauties of Ukrainian history and Ukrainian language and Ukrainian literature, but we still suspect that he's kind of a Ukrainian sheep in, I mean, a, a Russian wolf in Ukrainian sheep clothing. <laughs> and no matter how much I studied Ukrainian, no matter what I did, I, you know, I, I have actually became the first non-Ukrainian either and non-diaspora president of the International Association for Ukrainian Studies, and that meant convening a congress in Donetsk of all places. Uh, I was elected in Chernivtsi, but I served my term in, in Donetsk, and um, I, I thought I became about as big an advocate for Ukrainian studies as one could want from a German-American like myself. Um, but I never, I, I think I never uh, convinced entirely the, the skeptics among my, my, my critics. I mean, I, I, I did make the mistake on Alex Modell's suggestion, by the way, who is also Ukrainian-American, to write this article that became known as Does Ukraine Have a History? Which was taken 
provokacino, let's say, <laughs> by many readers, and, and, the, and the Slavic Review responses kind of uh, gauge that, that, res that, that uh, matter. But, but it's not been easy to convince people that what I'm doing is, I don't know how to say this, right, <laughs> good, um, possibly productive. And I'd like to you say that I, I really have, I think, discovering the Ukrainian thing, the theme, has kind of revived me and, and sort of the second half of my career. I'm not sure when that started, the second half of my career, but I, I was kind of getting very bogged down and, and depressed by the debates in Soviet history. And I, I knew I couldn't keep doing sort of old-fashioned kind of Fitzpatrick revisionism, all that stuff. It, it really bored me. And frankly, I, I'm not sure what we've learned <laughs> if I can be honest among you, uh, from the whole Fitzpatrick-Cohen controversies of, that you read about in, in great detail in Engerman. And I really think we, we kind of had a, a dead end uh, for a while. I mean, I, I think that's changed. I, I'm, I'm very happy to say I read some new scholarship um, that I'm very excited about, including one of my own students, Johan Helbeck, who sort of discovered diaries and, and consciousness and subjectivity, and, and Anna Krylova, who's at Duke now tenured. Uh, wrote a wonderful book about women in Soviet women in combat in World War II. Um, comes from a literature background, by the way, in, into history. So I, I, I think Soviet history has kind of discovered a new a new set of uh, problematica, which which has made it again uh, an exciting field, and and in contact with uh, anthropology in, in particular. But for the for, the, for, the, for a while, for a decade or two, I, I, I didn't see a future for myself as a Soviet historian and felt that I needed to go back into the late imperial period even to understand what I was trying to write about in the early Soviet period. And that wasn't, that wasn't a kind of normal, uh, I was trained really to start thinking about history from 1917 on. I, I, had, I did a master's thesis under Terry Emmons on the 1905 revolution, which is probably more than most Soviet historians do these days. But I really kind of focus most of my energy on, on, on the 20th century, uh, post-1917. So I've been relearning my old graduate school literature on, on, on the late 19th century and trying to rethink it through the prism of empire and nationality and ethnic identity and uh, colonialism as well. And it's been, it's been quite an exciting adventure. And again, this... Um, coming back to this presidency of the International Association of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, again, that was, <laughs> that whole process that led to my becoming that was, was very strange. A kind of a cabal between members of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in Kiev who wanted to keep <coughs> the association in their hands and they ended up in the end keeping it in their hands and a group of international Ukrainianists largely Harvard and um, <clears throat> some German Ukrainianists who wanted to break um, the hold of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in Kiev on the association and try to make it a more international, cosmopolitan, friendly uh, to the world association. <clears throat> so we fought for three years to make the convention uh, a much more international uh, convention, by which I mean the old uh, um, Mao, International Association of Ukrainianists was run like an old Soviet Academy of Science conference, which meant like a natural science conference where people, I mean, you heard, I think, stories on Thursday about people who would just give reports for, you know, half an hour each, no discussion, no expectation of discussion, one after another just summarizing their research results, like, like physicists or mathematicians. And <coughs> we thought, and, and again, I was, I was not leading this on my own. I, I had lots of Ukrainian younger colleagues support and encouragement to push for a kind of humanitarianization of, of the field, uh, taking it away from the sort of natural science um, paradigms and methods of work and make it a more interactive, shall we say, <laughs> Um, set of scholars and, 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 and a conference that, that really you know, allowed people to talk to each other. I mean, for, I mean the very first few international congresses was also um, a kind of disaster in that they would have the international scholars live in one hotel and the Ukrainian Ukrainianists live in another hotel 
where we had separate meals and we'd never meet with each other. It was as if, as if, I mean, I know they were doing that for money reasons to a large degree, but it was so against the whole idea of what we thought an international association should be, which is to, for people to, to mingle and to meet each other. So we tried, and I, I think some of our reforms survived, but then the next year I was replaced by a Ukrainian physicist, of all things, astrophysicist. Seemed like a very nice man, but I'm not sure what he had to do with Ukrainian studies. And the, the, the succeeding Congress, which was supposed to be in Simferopol, didn't happen in Simferopol because they never got their act together until two months before the Congress was supposed to happen, a major international Congress with a thousand participants from around the world. So they decided to have a last minute makeshift conference in Kiev, guess where? At the Academy of Sciences <laughs> Sanatorium. So they got it back. And where the future of Ukrainian International Association is today, I don't know, but, but at least you know, I, I know that uh, there's a lot of support both in Russia and in Ukraine for a thoroughgoing reform of the Academy of Science system, which I think is one of the major impediments to further um, international collaboration on our part because of the way that the Academy of Sciences work. And again, I have friends who are in the Academy of Sciences in both Russia and, and Ukraine and, and who are talented scholars, so it's not, uh, it's not a death sentence to be in the Academy of Sciences, but it's the whole um, ideological, cultural, educational operation that is the Academy of Sciences is something that has been less reformed, I think, than the KGB uh, or or the Orthodox Church, Church which is another, another one of those <laughs> resistant um, institutions. Um, again, this is, I'm not sure what we want to make a great deal of generalizations about this, but finally, Columbia hired somebody this year <coughs> in history to replace me and Dick Wartman and, and Brad Abrams. And it's a um, German scholar of Turkish ethnicity, um, who wrote his dissertation on Lviv, Lvov, Lvov, not Lemberg, well, I guess Lemberg too because there was a German occupation, uh, sort of during the immediate pre-World War II, through World War II and post-World War II, sort of the Sovietization, Germanization of Lvov. So he's a Ukrainianist, even though he's a German of Turkish <laughs> ancestry with a Princeton PhD. And he, what? He considers, he considers himself a Russianist. A Russianist. Okay. So, um, so I don't know if that's a success on my part that we finally <laughs> persuaded the Columbia History Department to hire someone who works on something as provincial and backward as Ukraine and Lvov, but um, we now have someone in place who I hope succeeds here and, and is able to build a program and make connections with the, the considerable Ukrainian institutions in the country. W one of the things I was doing this past week when I in between coming on Thursday and I mean today, was working in the um, reading room of the Ukrainian Free Academy of Arts and Sciences in America, UVAN, because my new research project is about again World War I and prisoners of war, Russian prisoners of war held in German, Austrian, and Hungarian camps during World War I, and the activities of the Union for the Liberation of Ukraine, which is a, a group of mostly expat Russian Ukrainians who ended up in the Austro-Hungarian Empire on the eve of the war, to Ukrainianize these Russian prisoners of war. Strangely enough, it sounds like the Bolsheviks doing to the peasants what I talked about in my first book, trying to turn them into <laughs> Red Army soldiers and Bolsheviks. Now I find Ukrainian activists, some of whom go on to be very prominent in Ukrainian diaspora politics, uh, trying to do the same thing to Russian prisoners of war uh, during World War I in these camps and, and having a very big educational cultural program to make them into Svidomi Ukrainci or conscious Ukrainians. And the, the materials at Uvan and at, at the Shevchenko Scientific Society archives and libraries are rich. Uh, and, and it makes sense that Colombia should do something in Ukraine because there are more Ukrainians in this area than Ukrainian Americans in this area. And if we're gonna, we had more Ukrainian Americans going through the undergraduate programs and, and graduate programs than that school to the north that seemed to get all of the money at the beginning, Harvard. And again, we collaborated with Harvard too, and we still collaborate with Harvard, and Harvard's done wonderful things, but for, for given the amount of money they have um, and have had, um, I think we've been doing a lot more at Columbia <laughs> lately than, than Harvard's been doing for a while. And I, you know, I, when I, I teach my main sort of bread and butter course, both here at Columbia and now at Arizona State, was Soviet history. Uh, alternate called Rise and Fall of the Soviet Union, or now 
This is the Arizona State version. It's called the Soviet Experiment, which I'm not sure I like yet, but that's, that's the title I was assigned. And one of the things I, I start out with when I was here, and, and, and I have a new version of it now in Arizona State, is to try to make um, Americans understand the complexity of Soviet and Russian nationality issues. When I first started teaching here on Broadway, there was a barber shop, long gone, unfortunately, um, which the students referred to as the Pan Slavic Barber Shop, because everyone there seemed to be speaking Russian. Uh, once I found out who they were, I would ask the students to ask them when they were getting their haircuts who they were. Except for one Polish Jew, um, who did speak Russian too, for, with some you know, accent, of course, um, the rest of them were Bukharan Jews who had come from Soviet Central Asia and who did in fact speak Russian when the students were around. When I showed up and they knew I spoke Russian, they would switch to another language, which I asked them what it was. It said Svoyezik, which is you know, some sort of Farsi, Hebrew, medieval derived mix that is spoken among Bukharan Jews. And I'd say, students ask them who they are. And they would say they're from Russia. Most of them had never lived in what we call Russia today. They came straight from Tashkent or Bukhara or Samarkand to New York. And uh, yet they told the students they were Russians. And I said, why do you think they did that? <laughs> because it's just easier than to explain the whole history of imperial relations in Turkestan uh, and in the Russian Empire. Uh, in, in Arizona, I recently found, thanks to one of my former students who's um, now teaching with me as well, something called Yasha's from Russia. And I was looking for pilmieni and you know, good black bread, and I thought, I'll never get it in Arizona in the desert. Wrong. There's Yasha's from Russia, which makes pilmieni and vareniki and, and kvashina and kapusta and has everything you could want from, you know, like the old Soviet days, what people would have liked to have in the old Soviet days, but never could find in the stores. Well, there it is. So I asked Yasha where he's from, Tashkent. <laughs> and he's again a Bukharan Jew who never lived in Russia, but he calls his store Yasha's from Russia. And I said to the students, here's another example of just how complicated this country is and how we cannot just say they're all Russians and we know who the Russians are and we know what Russia is uh, because that doesn't work in this country. And I, so, I, so I, I use that as a, a, a sort of hook to, 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 to be an excuse to explain the history of nationality politics and the changes in the different relationships between different na nations uh, over, the, over the time. And um, I, I really think that's, uh, and again, if you do that approach, I, I have found it successful with American student audiences because um, First of all, I, even, even in Arizona State, about a fourth of my students, as was certainly true here at Columbia, were American Jews whose ancestors came from the Pale of Settlement. So I've learned Jewish history as a result of that in order to explain to them why their parents left or their ancestors left to Russia or the Soviet Union. Uh, I still have students, even in Arizona today, who were born in the Soviet Union but brought up in this country and also want to know about the Soviet experience and why their parents would have left this place. And many of them are going back um, to see for themselves, which is a good thing. And then we have, you know, I have a sort of typical Poles and Lithuanians and Ukrainians in the class, Americans, Ukrainian Americans. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's something that's a natural connect with uh, uh, both my Arizona students and certainly my Columbia students. And one that, is, is, that represents a kind of a legitimate achievement of our field that we have taken this kind of imperial turn and now appreciate nation and empire in, in ways that we, we didn't in the past, which, I mean, I, I won't give you the, the details of all of my review essay here because you have had it to read yourself. Um, and again, I, I think this is uh, coming back to the question of humility. Um, uh, it, it allows us to treat Russia in an, a universe of imperial states that makes it not so weird or peculiar or unusual. Um, because if you, again, when I teach comparative empires with the British Empire, the French Empire, and you know, we raise the question of is America an empire? Has America ever been an empire? If, if, and if so, what kind of an empire? Uh, it, 
uh, opens up a kind of discussion that wasn't possible before when it was just Russia as evil empire, you know, sort of the Reagan pipes era uh, version of it, in which empire is, is automatically a dirty word and a bad name. And um, we, the great nation of liberty here, even though we do have an empire state building and this is the empire state, so you wonder um, when did we have this sort of imperial moment that we liked empire uh, as part of our identity and, and now, now we claim that we're the leading anti-imperialists or we used to, used to be the anti imperialists So I, I think um, this is one way in which the field of Russian Eurasian studies has been able to position itself as a major player in our disciplines, in history, anthropology, literature, um, by um, just opening our eyes in a different way than we used to open our eyes to what we study. Again, not everyone should be doing empires because there are plenty of things that happened in Russia and Ukraine and Poland that maybe had little to do with empire and nation, but not too many. I'm not sure that you can <laughs> escape it too far. Uh, whatever your, whether it's intellectual history or cultural history or um, institutional history that you, you can escape too far. Um, yeah, I think, I know I had a lot of more things to say, but I'm trying, trying to figure out where I'm going. So that, that's kind of my, my odyssey uh, in, in some sort of lessons. <laughs> I suppose I, I, f I feel after reading that Engerman book like I've met practically everybody who's featured in there, so I must be some kind of a veteran. I must have something to say to you all of what I've learned from having met these people and worked with them in many cases. Um, and I, I chose to do it through this kind of strange, semi-autobiographical way, be so you can see how it's impacted me, uh, the, the people I worked with and the um, things I studied and chose to study and how I got there and my relations with uh, again, especially Russia, Ukraine, and Poland, which is where I spent the most time uh, in my career and where my language skills have been, have given me the best um, opportunity to make, um, to make some kind of, well, to have fun for one and to learn something, I think, uh, on the other side. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any kind of questions because I think it's probably time for me to stop and open up for that now too. And I'd, I'd like very much to hear your reaction to what, what you've been hearing uh, all this past two weeks uh, since you've heard from many colleagues of mine who have been thinking hard about um, what to do with this strange thing known as area studies. And again, I, I, you know, one of the things I also tell my own administration is you know, if you're interested in transdisciplinary studies, one of the sort of original, the Ur trans transdisciplinary studies was area studies. And, and we started it here at Columbia at Harvard back, back right after the war. Um, and now it's, for some reason they don't want to consider us that, even though I, I think you know, we've been doing that kind of, if you read you know, the, again the, the accounts of, 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 of Engerman, there were people who were in political science and, and, and um, economics who were reading novels, God forbid, and, and writing commentary on novels. And, uh, learning from people who do literature and vice versa. And I, I don't think, you know, that's a bad thing. And I don't think we should let that go, um, despite all of the pressures of disciplinary specialization and professionalization. And um, I, I think, you know, there's always going to be that, that tension between the disciplines and the departments on the one hand and, and area studies and, and people who look for other spaces for intellectual uh, stimulation and collaboration. So, so I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>